प्रोफेसर उत्सव पटनायक मेंबर्स एंड फ्रेंड्स ऑफ द सहमत ऑर्गेनाइजेशन यंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन टू सैंग द टू सॉन्ग्स एंड ऑल अदर फ्रेंड्स I am very happy and feel privileged in fact that I should have been invited to speak on so important an event as the Champaran Satyagraha of 1970 whose centenary we are now celebrating hopefully not only in Bihar but in different parts of India <coughs> Before I speak more about Champaran, I should like to speak about the Indian National Movement because Champaran Satyagraha, although on the face of it, it uh, may a present present movement, was of extreme importance for the national movement. and i would further argue that understanding it is very important even today for us who have important causes that we pursue it goes without saying that if you look at the entire history of india the indian national movement was perhaps or was probably certainly the greatest creation of the indian people and therefore champaran satyagraha the first act in which the stream of peasant unrest joined the stream of the national movement is of extraordinary importance um for these reasons which i shall now try to go into some detail celebrating champaran is very important for us not only as a remembrance but also as a means of guidance for work in our own causes as professor bipin chandra has pointed out the indian national movement was indeed unique in that its ideology began not out of any religious sentiment not out of any simple patriotic movement of native versus foreigner but it began with an understanding of how britain was exploiting india and the rejection of british policies if not british rule in the beginning for that reason long before the champaran satyagraha dada bhai naro ji from around 1871 had been speaking of how britain was exploiting in india the drain the tribute the burden of taxation the impoverishment all this was embodied in the collection of his articles which were published in 1901 but had been in circulation in india earlier poverty and un british rule in india almost simultaneously ramesh chandra dat was writing the economic history of british india in which he showed how britain step by step was exploiting the indian people and impoverishing india today we can sustain their arguments reinforce their arguments go into further detail by immense use of statistics in which professor utsa patnai has taken a leading role and therefore i would not speak much about that 
but my point is that indian national movement arose out of a grievance not of middle classes but of the indian poor very little dada bhai noroji or r sidat had to say about the indian middle class they belong to it their readers belong to the indian middle class but they spoke of the indian poor and that's a remarkable theater of the early nationalist thought in india whether you take justice ranade or jv joshi or deoskar and the other writers who spoke who wrote on indian economy from the nationalist point of view that soon volumes were published in 1991 and 1993 through volumes they still remain classics these views were translated into various languages uh, barkatullah khan for instance translated or wrote in uh, some dub in urdu the whole uh, theory whole uh, presentation of the tribute and empowerment of india based on the writings of dada bhai nuri and ramesh ramesh gandhi ji himself in hind swaraj in 1909 written in gujarati summarized their conclusions but although the indian national congress the nationalists rose the, the raised the question of empowerment and british tribute they had no links with the poor dada bhai noroji and ramesh that could not organize the poor indian nationalists who were middle class men could not recognize the reorganize the uh, organized the poor they were not linked with the very masses whose cause they were representing in other words they were lawyers without any connection living connection with their clients champaran ke for the first time the poor had their detailed grievances cared for by the nationalist leadership or by the potential nationalist leadership and the man who did it of course was mahatma gandhi now when you come to mahatma gandhi uh when one should one should remember that from 1890s to 1914 he was in or except for some short period he was in south africa working for the rights fighting for the rights and working for the welfare of indians in south africa i know it is now fashionable to run down gandhi ji's years in south africa as years of our socialist who tried to build indian communities Uh, position apart from that of the black africans those who criticize to those who take this position like arundhati roy and others are welcome to that position the reality is our different the reality is that in india itself that kind of agitation which gandhi organized and led in south africa had never taken place here there had been no march of 2000 miners with their families as took place in stonewall in 1913 nowhere in india nowhere in india were identity cards burned nowhere in india had women gone to prison in such large numbers that smuts had to released them because there was no provision in his jails for so many women these were things unheard of in india now clearly this is what should strike us today not the limitedness of gandhi ji's causes but the actual 
struggle, the actual forms of struggle, unheard of in India, unheard of in his own mother. And therefore, when he came to India in 1915, he went from uh, South Africa to England and then he came here. Gandhi ji was already a mature man. He was already 44. And he spent the next three years, as we all know, in traveling around India, next two or three years. Um, he attended the Indian National Congress sessions. He paid homage to the goal of home rule, Swaraj or Khud Mukhtari. But it was something else that he was interested in. Organizing for the first time the poor. And it is here that Champaran becomes very important. It's his first uh, step in the whole uh, history of struggles which was finally to obtain freedom for India. A small beginning apparently, but a crucial one. Gandhiji, because of his struggles in South Africa, was a well-known figure in India by 1970. At least among the, those who were educated in the middle class, who read about his uh, agitation, Satyagraha's uh, bouts of passive resistance in South Africa. But he was unknown to the Indian poor. In fact, the nationalists were unknown to the Indian poor. They couldn't tender, as R.P. that said, the very the huts of the poor whose cause they represented on paper. It was Gandhi who entered that hut. Um, Professor Patnaik spoke of the indigo planters, the European indigo planters. Many of them did indeed come from West Indies. Many of them were what were then called non Eurasians, Europeans. Persons of European descent long settled in India. Now, uh, the importance of uh, the grievances against the European planters in the first place was that whereas the whereas the country was exploited by Britain, through taxation, through tribute, through free trade, through deindustrialization, these things did not pit English directly against the exploit exploited. The land tax was taken through the Zamidars, the natives. The indirect taxes were collected by Indian native tax collectors. The British cloth, which drove Indian spinners and weavers out of employment, were sold by local Indian shopkeepers. Where were the Englishmen in all this? It was only in the plantations, whether they were tea plantations in Assam or Indo plant indigo plantations in Assam, in Bengal and Bihar, that individual Englishmen faced the exploited Indians. And this is one important part in the Champaran Satyagraha. The exploiters were not Zamidars, Indian Zamidars, the exploiters were British exploiters. To single them out was one important uh, and brilliant act of Gandhi. Begin, the, uh, begin your Satyagraha, begin your agitation from this particular point where the Indian 
present face the European oppression. Whether you spoke of home rule or not, whether you spoke of the national movement or not, it was bound to become a part of the national struggle. So let's come and see. I would not go so far as uh, Professor Sapatnak had gone in the 18th century, although that's very important. I would only uh, say that indigo plantations were the earliest European plantations in India. They had the longest history. Uh, the boilers for processing indigo had been, uh, that method had been discovered in the West Indies and employed there with slave labor. Now these bo boiling boiler factories were established in Bengal by European indigo planters. And uh, uh, they then uh, uh, bought zamidaris or took long leases from zamidars so that they got control over the peasants of those zamidars and then force them to grow indigo and sell that indigo at the prices they fixed so that from the very beginning the exploitation, the degree of exploitation was severe, much more severe than by the zamidars, which is saying a lot. And so you have Bandhu Mitra's famous Neel Darpan, in, 18, uh, in 1860, uh, the famous play in which the oppression of the planters was portrayed and almost simultaneously the so-called indigo disturbances in Bengal. But apart from those disturbances, the remarkable thing is the quiet with which the peasants suffered that oppression. The indigo planters spread into Bihar, into areas where indigo could be produced well. They purchased zamidaris or, as in Champaran, could lay long leases, thekas from the Betia zamidari and other zamidaris in the area, and then imposed a large number of oppressive practices on the indigo plant, on the peasants. These were numerous, forcing the peasants who became their tenants to grow indigo on the best part of their lands. And then uh, by that indigo, not by the actual weight of the crop, but by the area with the crop occupied, which always resulted in very low prices paid to the peasants. They also took begar, they also imposed illegal cesses, they also uh, claimed a large number of things like uh, even claiming the bodies, corpses of animals, cattle and so on, so that they could get the skins of the animals which had some prices, so that all kinds of malpractices were posed by the zamidars, of the, by the planters. In 1880s, a synthetic dye was discovered in Germany and that, as a result of it, indigo prices crashed. The indigo planters transferred the entire cost, the entire loss owing to the uh, indigo new synthetic dye onto the shoulders of the peasants. Uh, if now indigo, indigo became so cheap that it was not worth the peasants to grow it, since the planters themselves were not purchasing it, the planters still took a large amount of money called tama to for allowing the peasants 
to shift to other crops. And they raised the rents on the agricultural lands. Uh, they made many other impositions uh, where they were entitled to uh, on paper through thekedari or through long leases from the zamidars by increasing rent and imposing other cesses and taxes. So the attempt was to throw the entire cost of the loss of indigo trade onto the shoulders of the peasants. Yet such was their influence, such was the oppression, such was the control <coughs> they imposed on peasants through their agents and so-called chaprasis and others that the peasants did not protest. They could complain, but to whom? In 1914, when the World War, World War I broke out, suddenly indigo prices rose because the competition of the synthetic dye was no longer there. But if the loss of the competition from uh, synthetic dye was put on the shoulders of the peasants, now that indigo became important, the uh, entire profits were sought to be monopolized by the planters by increasing their oppressive practice, by intensifying their oppressive practices against the peasants. The tava or compensation for choosing the crop that the peasants wanted to cultivate was increased. The abhav or illegal cesses were increased. In the Thekedari villages, the long lease villages, the rents were increased. The prices paid for indigo were made lower and lower because of counting on the basis not of the actual produce but by the area in which the crop was grown. Uh, the rate, the ordinary produce rate, the average was from the rate, produce rate taken in purchase was very low compared to the actual amount of the indigo that was produced from the, these areas. This was the common practice. So, uh, instead of the peasants benefiting from the from, uh, from the uh, world from the closing of the trade with Germany and the competition of the synthetic dye. In fact, the peasants were put in a more and more an enviable position. So the uh, oppressions increased. And it was in this situation where the planters had everything where they had full sway, where they could destroy anyone's house, where they could do almost anything they wanted in the district of Champaran and other adjoining areas. It was in this situation that the famous session of the Indian National Congress was held at Lucknow in December 1916, where the Congress and the League entered into a pact whereby the Muslim League accepted the uh, obje objective of home rule and the Congress accepted the principle of communal electorates. Gandhiji was also there. Some people came from Champaran and told the delegates of the Congress whom they could meet, including Gandhiji, of the grievances they suffered. Gandhiji refused to move any resolution until he had seen the things for himself. And it was here that it was then that after he had gone to Calcutta, he was taken by one of the peasants who was oppressed and whose house, in fact, who had been destroyed by planters, as Gandhiji found later, that Rajkumar Shukla, that Gandhiji was brought 
to Patna, he agreed to visit Champaran and see for himself. What happened in Patna? How Rajkumar Shukla suddenly disappeared for some reason? How Gandhi ji was had a hard time in the place he was set up, which was put up here, which was Dr. Rajendra Prasad's house, who was away, unfortunately, at the time, are all parts of traditional law. Gandhi ji himself mentions that, but we are not concerned here with that. What is important is that Gandhi ji persevered, and that's the important thing. Left alone, he still persevered. He goes to Mazafarpur, meets people there, and then proceeds to Champaran district. Motihari is that, ultimately. And what does he do? He says that I have come for an inquiry. There was Champaran Satyagraha is a misnomer. It was in fact much more than a Satyagraha. But what Gandhiji described was an inquiry. He had just come to find out for himself. And he gathered a band of followers of whom Dr. Rajendra Prashad and Acharya Kripalani were well known. And some vakils and they began recording peasants' complaints. When one peasant seems too ordinary, what is the use? But when one peasant had come to record complaints, ten followed. For the first time, the planters saw defiance. That had never happened before. And therefore, the British government also woke up. Of course, they were, they knew Gandhi's eminence for his work in South Africa. And what here happened, what then happened, certainly team a lesson for us what a political leadership should do. Um, on 16th of April, um, the district magistrate of Chimpar, Chimparan issued an order under section 144 CRPC asking Mr. Gandhi to leave the Champaran district immediately. Here, what is important is what Gandhi did. He did not hide behind anyone else. He did not say, I am now leaving when the, the, the ban is lifted, I will come back. He did not push anyone else into prison. He simply appeared before the district magistrate, Motihari, to explain his position. What the government and the administration had expected was that he would deny that he was defying, that he would say CRPC, this section does not apply in his case, and there would be long, prolonged proceedings taking many days, cooling the agitation. I don't know whether Gandhiji did it on the spur of the moment or otherwise, but as soon as he appeared before the district magistrate, he seems to have realized what the government was after. From his correspondence, we can see early that he was expecting imprisonment. Another important fact, go ahead to prison himself, not leaving it to others. He declared instead of saying not guilty and trying to argue the case, he declared himself guilty. He said, I am, I am guilty of breaking the law because there is a higher voice of conscience. The entire game of the British government administration, of the local administration fell. 
when you declare when the person concerned declares himself guilty then where is the sense in proceedings what is the sense of giving arguments what is the sense of proceed pro, of prolonging the proceedings the district magistrate to defend it to decide then and there he tried to uh, release mr gandhi ji on bail and gandhi ji refused to offer any bail he said i don't have rupees 100 then he released him on his own acknowledgement oral acknowledgement that he would not i go away from the court of course he intended to stay in Jamp champara and that ultimately forced the lieutenant governor of bihar and urissa that was one province at that time to withdraw the proceedings what could they do if they arrested gandhi ji they knew that the consequences would be felt all over india the whole thing would become an all india point of grievance and therefore they surrendered that was the first surrender and gandhi ji then went on with fresh uh, and his team with fresh additions particularly from the lawyer, lawyers and teachers college teachers of uh, muzaffarpur and champara to gather complaints from the peasants large numbers are given but gandhi ji estimated that by the next month uh next month 4000 had been gathered and ultimately 8000 complaints of the peasants had been gathered uh, i understand that larger estimates are there but i would go by gandhi ji's own enumeration these but these 8000 complaints were no simple matter in actual terms this was the entire thing that the satyagraha of champana satyagraha was about no laws were broken but by merely going to villages recording complaints peasant complaints under the noses of the planters and their agents which standing their uh, pressures the whole authority of the planters crumbled after all much of the authority of the midar the planter and all those people has a moral basis that crumbled and the british government was forced to negotiate one of the interesting things in gandhi ji's operation was that he never refused negotiations he would meet planters be very polite with them he would meet government officials but what he did was he never left the side of the peasants he was with them all along and that second a lesson to all he did not let planters blame the blandishments or the kindness of british government officers including the lieutenant governor of bengal and urissa himself he to meet him and to speak with him he remained continuously not only the peasant spokesman but completely with the peasants all the time uh, first there were negotiations with a high officer who uh, actually whose position is not mentioned in the collected works of mahatma gandhi honorable william mod at ranchi on 10th may gandhi ji went and met him at ranchi was quite a distance from champaran but he went there but when mod asked him to suspend the collection of complaints gandhi ji said that no my inquiry is not yet over but i will send you a report preliminary report so the implantations of the british administration was unsuccessful returning to champaran gandhi ji sent a preliminary report about peasant complaints what their grievances were but he continued with the signatures 
until the British government surrendered. It can, it looks awkward. I mean, surprising that by mere recording of complaints, the British government should suddenly surrender. The thing was, it had never happened before. Who had taken peasants' complaints? Who had gone to the villages? Who had aroused by the mere taking of complaints? Who had destroyed the traditional authorities of the exploiters? It had never happened before. So, the whole Champaran Satyagraha was to look at it. So, mild an operation, record complaints, but so effective in the overthrow of the moral authority of the planters. And there is another thing to remember before we will come to that point. Gandhi ji had his targets precisely fixed. The target of attack were planters, they were not zamidars. He never spoke against the zamidars, not even against the Betia zamidars. Well, later in the committee, I will be mentioning that, uh, the British officials made an attempt to transfer some of the burden that the peasants would be, uh, uh, would be freed from onto the shoulders of the zamidars, the Betia zamidari. Gandhiji demurred. He did not agree. He did not want to uh, make opponents of the zamidars. I know all this opens Gandhiji to criticisms from our subaltern friends and others that he did not at that time lead as uh, they tried to protect the Zamidar's interests. But the fact was that Gandhiji wanted to isolate the planters, the European planters. And for that it was important that the, that the Indian Zamidars should remain neutral. They should not be thrown onto the side of the planters. Uh, there's, an, there's an opinion, you can have your opinion about it, but I particularly think it has a lesson for us. Don't increase the number of your enemies at a particular point in a struggle. Try to isolate your opponent. And from that point of view, Gandhiji was immensely successful. When the, when the planters wanted the Landowners Association of Bihar to support their case, the landowners refused. They didn't want to enter into this because they know, knew that up till now Gandhiji had also remained neutral. He had done nothing to uh, annoy the Bihar Zamila. And this was one particular reason why the planters were isolated and the British government had to surrender on the entire issue. The subsequent developments can be briefly told, but I still remain, I mean that they were important. I still feel that they were as important as Gandhiji's carrying out of the uh, so-called inquiry the collection of villagers of the peasants' uh, grievances. Ultimately, on 5th of June, nearly two months, more than two months after the agitation had begun, or the inquiry had begun, the recollection of complaints had begun, EA Gate the Lieutenant Governor of Bihar and Odisha and the Chief Secretary had a long meeting with Gandhiji at Ranchi. The British government abandoned the cause of the planters. Whatever the planters had tried, their racial affinities with British officials and so on and so forth, the British government thought, knew that a continuous agitation, merely recording of the grievances, would create 
create a totally new situation for them in Bihar. It had never happened before. It had never happened that peasants in thousands should go and record their grievances. And therefore, they decided to abandon the planters. They agreed that a committee would be formed, three British officials, including the chairman, Gandhiji, one representative of the Midars, and one representative of planters. That what this committee would decide, would recommend, would be carried out by the government. Now, what is often forgotten is that this too was very important. Gandhiji attended every meeting of the committee. He was ready to respond to any proposal. And here it was that he responded to the proposal which would have annoyed the zamidars and did not agree to that. Although peasants would have gained, but the zamidars would have been annoyed. And that was very important to save the entire uh, the, the remainder of the uh, reforms. When the committee's report came out in October, that committee's report is worth reading. I'm, I hope that it, some day will come when it becomes compulsory reading for every official of this blessed government. How you could write a report? How you could condemn the planters? How you could go into each grievance and say the peasants are right? How you could say that the entire fabric of the oppressive structure of the planters should be scaled up? This is an astonishing text. Almost everything is conceded. Almost everything. And it's con conceded in immensely precise language. Gandhi's presence in it, Gandhi's, Gandhiji's serious participation in it, whenever the minutes show that whenever new proposal was came, he was ready with his response. He was ready to give concessions. Ultimately, he found that as far as um, the particular extra charge that the um, planters had made, on the peasants, that could not be reduced by 40% as he had said, but only by 26%. He considered that, Shabesh. He considered that. But you could say that he had tried hard and hard. Uh, the planter said nothing more than 25%, but he still gained a moral point by putting at 26%. But that was all. But otherwise, for everything else, he got whatever he, what the peasants wanted. To the last detail. But that work was not ended because the, some of the recommendations of the committee required legal changes. Others, the British government announced by proclamation that there can't be any abhaps, there cannot be any legal cesses, and so forth and so on. So, <laughs> Champaran Agrarian Bill was framed and here also Gandhiji took care to see how the bill was ordered and you can see in his collected works how he uh, tried to get the wording changed and you usually succeeded. It is serious leadership. Go to the end of the struggle. I tried to see where did he celebrate there is no reference to celebration of his victory in Champaran. He suddenly turns after that success to other matters. In an immense modesty when he had in fact forced the British government to abandon the planters in the interest of the oppressed peasants. An immense, immense success never attained before perhaps in the history of colonial rule in India. Now, throughout the Champaran Satyagraha and subsequently, Gandhi never forgot the larger concerns of India. 
टू आर वेरी रेलिवेंट आई वॉज लुकिंग फॉर द कलेक्टेड वर्क वॉल्यूम देर टू वॉल्यूम्स इन विच चंपारण मेन वॉल्यूम एंड द नेक्स्ट एंड आई सडनली फॉर्म द स्टेटमेंट ऑफ गांधी दैट the taking that over cost lotter and it total over cost lotter is not worth any injury to human human being a human being is far more precious than a cow that statement although there are letters about serving the cow but this is the statement there soon after the champaran satyagraha riots broke out in ara and what does gandhi say he says the hindus in ara should compensate their muslim brethren why they have looted them and if they can't the hindus of the rest of india should compensate their muslim their muslim brothers uh, this is the kind of leadership not looking for plaudits but looking for principles so when we see today the champaran satyagraha in the context of the indian national movement it is of course easy to pick out one's uh, particular uh, grievances objections criticisms of the indian national movement and gandhi ji particularly one criticism usually is which are some subaltern friends ranjit guha and others have particularly emphasized this that after all in gandhi ji the agrarian who move, move, movements it is the upper peasants who are involved and not the laborers who have laborers uh it may be true it is very difficult as far as the case of champaran presents is concerned to find out whether the grievances that were rectified benefited only the larger peasants and not the other small and middling peasants i see no reason for that all sections of peasants benefited it is true that landless laborers did not benefit except perhaps through the prohibition of begar and the control over the skinning of animals being left to the local community but even if it is right that who benefited from these were the larger peasants even that was unique in indian history it had never happened before that peasants of any kind upper middle or lower had won a battle against the british government it had never happened before and to forget it forget this important fact and to say that as such a such a class was excluded and necessarily excluded because they had no direct grievances against the planters is to cavil at petty points and forget the major point um we see that in further struggle for instance in the in the next year the uh, struggle the kheda struggle and the industrial strike in ahmedabad the industrial agitation in which gandhi was opposed to his own major financial backers the states of ahmedabad it could be said that the kheda satyagraha only benefited the other elements the pattidars and others it has been said by subalterns and about the ahmedabad strike that it ended in a compromise but one we must remember that every trade union action ends in a compromise you can't buy a factory strike attain socialism when uh 
I have been working in or actually wanted to work in a trade union and that was of course AMU employed on association. <coughs> but party leader who had been so, uh, in the an associate of Bhagat Singh said that if you don't compromise your union will end soon. The trade union movement develops only through struggle and compromises. And that could also be applied to the national movement. The national movement risking everything on one struggle would have a short, would have had a short life. And therefore, when Gandhiji in the Champaran struggle concentrated only on planters and only on grievances against the planters, there cannot be any, I hope, I think myself, I may be mistaken, there cannot be any particular complaint against him. Uh, what is important there is, of course, that Gandhi in that struggle tried to protect to whatever extent he could the peasants whom he was leading. He never put them at risk. And any risky points he was there himself. And that too is a lesson for us. Let us not use people who we lead to agitation as cannon fodder. They are very precious. Not in useless struggles. But keep the uh, real uh, target in mind and always be in day to day struggles, always have a room, a space for compromise. That's only how people's movements, trade unions, present organizations can be built up. Today all these things are important because in our country unfortunately organizations of the working class and peasants are in obvious decline and therefore it is time that we learn from the experience of earlier, of our earlier experiences in which Gandhi's own organization, Gandhi's own struggles also have a place. Friends, I think I have said enough. I can only end by saying that the Champaran Satyagraha opened an entire series, began an entire series of struggles which were after every struggle on a higher plane. Champaran Satyagraha, industrial strike in Ahmedabad, Khedwa Satyagraha, both in 1918, the April Satyagraha leading to Jagyan Balabhav in 1919, the non-cooperation and Khilafat movement of 1920 and 22, sweeping throughout India. Champaran opened the gates and that is why it should be celebrated. Thank you.